All right, everybody, this is chapter seven, um, the appendicular skeleton. So we're gonna go through the pectoral girdle and the upper limb in this lecture. Um, so starting on page 67 of your lab manual. So this, the pectoral girdle is uh, the bones that hold together your shoulder joint. And the two bones that are considered part of your pectoral girdle are the clavicle and scapula. So do not include the humerus. Um, a lot of students want to do that, but it is not. So the clavicle and the scapula, um, it might be a little surprising that these two bones um, are creating a joint because your shoulder joint doesn't look very secure. And that's absolutely true. Your shoulder joint is really, really flexible. So think about um, the wide ranging arm circles that you can do. You can um, you know, put your arms behind your back. It's a very limber and flexible joint, and this goes back to our ancestors and how we evolved living in trees and being able to swing from branch to branch and climb trees. So you really needed a very limber shoulder joint. So the bones cannot actually be very close together because the closer and more fitting the bones are, the more stable and limiting the joint would be. So we have a very open joint, um, and the humerus is held in place largely by soft connective tissue of tendons and ligaments. Um, around the bones. So um, because the clavicle attaches to the axial skeleton, the scapula can move quite freely across the thorax, right? Um, so this is a really great joint for flexibility, but um, con you know, the bad thing is that it's very bad for stability. It's not a very stable joint. So shoulder injuries are very, very common. Um, in normal activity, people can hurt their shoulder all the time. This uh, picture here of a dislocation, this is a very dramatic uh, sort of uh, bad shoulder injury where the humerus actually falls out of its normal position, um, but it is a very common um, shoulder injury. Um, we'll talk about um, the rotator cuff in the muscles unit because I know a lot of you guys might be very athletic um, or involved in sports and the rotator cuff is something you hear a lot about, but we'll get to that in the shoulder in the uh, muscles. So let's take a look at the bone of the scapula. I'm sorry, the clavicle comes first, the clavicles first. You have two clavicles and um, they have two ends. So there is the end of the clavicle that articulates with the sternum. So we just call that the sternal end, as we can see here. And there's the end of the clavicle that articulates with the scapula. And the particular region of the scapula that it touches is called the acromion. So that's why the, uh, it's called the acromial end. Alternatively, you can also call these the medial end and the lateral end, that's just fine. Let's actually look at the picture here and just look at how the scapula attaches to your body, right? How it fits in your body. So here we have the sternal end. We can see that the, clavic the sternal end of the clavicle makes a joint with the clavicular notch of your manubrium, right? So this little area right here of your manubrium is where they articulate. On, so this is the medial side of the bone. On the lateral side of the bone, we can see that the acromial end or the lateral end of the clavicle articulates with a particular part of the scapula called the acromion, okay? So it's most lateral, and so that's also called the lateral end. The other two features um, that are listed in your outline, we are not going to cover in the class, so you can cross those out. Um, your task is really when you see a clavicle or when you have a clavicle in your hand is to um, differentiate between the two ends. So you can see that the acromial end is much rounder, right? It's round, and if you had it in your hand, it actually be flat. Um, and then the sternal end is blunt. So it ends at a blunt um, feature there, okay? So the sternal end has a sort of a, a flat, blunt ending to it and the acromial end curves, comes to a little bit of a point, and it's very curved. So that's um, what you want to remember. All right, let's look at the scapula. So there are two scapula. Uh, the E is plural, so scapulae. Let's get started with the features. So the first one is that acromion, or also called the acromial process. And um, let's start actually with the posterior side. And let's talk about the posterior side of the scapula. So you can see that the anterior scapula and the posterior scapula look different. And that's because on the posterior side, we have a very large projection called a spine. All right, so on very, very thin people, you can actually see the scapular spine. 
And so that ridge is going to end at the acromion. All right, so this region is the acromion. So the spine becomes the acromion um, laterally. Um, so that's the first one. The second term is the axillary or lateral border. All right, so since this is our lateral side of the bone, we want to look at the border. So it's just the edge of the bone that faces the lateral side of your body. So that's the lateral border. We can see the lateral border on this side. You can see how the lateral border is kind of curved a little bit. Think about your armpit. So this is the um, side of the scapula that's going to be facing your armpit. And so your armpit is a curved feature. I like to think of those curved features as um, being similar. The medial border is the border that is going to be um, closer to your vertebral column. And I like to think about my vertebral column as being straight up and down. And so my medial border is more straight up and down, right? So that's my medial border, or you can call it the vertebral border because it faces your vertebra. Now we have a superior border, right? So that's just the upper border. So this is our superior border, our superior border. Nice and easy so far. Um, we have some angles, all right? Now angles, again, are just turns in the bone. So let me just use blue for the angles. So we have our superior angle, which is this turn here, and we have an inferior angle here, right? So not, it's pretty easy so far. We have a couple angles. Now let's talk about the suprascapular notch. It is a little notch that we find in the scapula on the superior border, okay? So suprascapular notch. The coracoid process is going to be a process that is most visible anteriorly, okay? So the coracoid process, it begins, it sort of juts out on the anterior side of the bone, the front of the bone, and it forms what I call like a letter C or a curved, if you're trying to make the letter C with your index finger, it's gonna look something like this. So coracoid process has two letter C's in it, right? And that's how I remembered coracoid process when I was studying this stuff coracoid process looks like it's trying to make the letter C. On your body, the coracoid process is going to be um, the very front of your shoulder. So where your um, humerus meets your shoulder joint, if you were to put your finger um, on the front of your chest where they meet, that's approximately where you find the coracoid process. All right, the scapular spine, we talked about that, right? This nice big ridge only on the posterior side of your scapula, that's our spine. Then we have the supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Those are two fossa, so fossae, I should say, that's um, my plural form. It's the word spinous, right, is in the, in the name. So that's referring to the spine. So there is a fossa or depression above the spine, so we call that the supraspinous fossa. There's also a depression below the spine, so that's the infraspinous fossa. When we get to muscles, there is a muscle that's lying in that fossa, and nice, uh, and luckily it's named the same thing. So the supraspinous fossa will have the supraspinatus muscle in it, and the infraspinous fossa will have the infraspinatus muscle in it. So it's really nice correlation that way. The next fossa is called the subscapular fossa, and that is gonna be on the anterior side. So you can only see this on the front. And it's basically just the entire region here, okay? So subscapular fossa, I know the, the line is pointing to, um, it's just kind of in this region, right? The subscapular fossa. And there is a muscle that lies there, the, subscap the subscapularis. All right, let's look at the glenoid cavity and then two tubercles. And to do that, we can look at it this way. So the glenoid cavity is gonna be the region where the head of the humerus articulates. So it's going to be um, that joint. So let's take a look at it from the lateral view. So this is our nice glenoid cavity, again, nice and smooth so that when the bones form that joint, um, it's not rough and allows the, the joint to move freely or smoothly. Um, then we have two tubercles. Remember the word tubercle means a little bump. So there's a supra glenoid tubercle, which means it's above the glenoid cavity, and that's a little bump here. And there's an infra, glenoid tubercle, which is a bump formed underneath here, okay? So both of those tubercles are important for the tendons of muscles of the arm to attach. All right, so that is it for the scapula.
Moving on to the upper extremity, we're gonna start with the humerus. So the humerus is your arm bone, right? You have two of them. And we're looking at um, the features here, beginning with the head. So the head is nice and obvious, it's round, okay? So it's going to articulate again with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Now, heads, with a bone has a head, it usually has a neck. So we have two necks on this one. This is unusual because it has two necks. The anatomical neck is um, basically where that rounded head ends, and there's going to be a rough line around the head. So I'm gonna enlarge this. It's not super visible in the drawing, but you can kind of see how there's a rough area like this. So that is gonna be the anatomical neck, and it goes all the way around, as you can see here, okay? The surgical neck is called the surgical neck, um, and this is probably where you would most likely point if you were to try and find a neck, um, it's where the humerus breaks a lot. And so, you know, that's why it's surgical. It's, it requires surgery at times when you break this area. So that's the surgical neck. Now let's look for great, the two tubercles. Um, so I want to point out this on the anterior side. So I'm going to make this a little smaller. Notice the anterior view and the posterior view. So the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle are best seen, actually the lesser is only seen on the anterior side. They are bumps, okay? So the greater tubercle is higher up and bigger. Greater means bigger, so this is our greater tubercle. And our lesser tubercle is lower and more anterior and smaller. Then we have a groove between the two tubercles, and this is called the intertubercular sulcus. Um, people always have Students will have lots of trouble saying that with ease beginning off, but you'll get it if you say it a lot. Practice it. Inter, intertubercular groove or intertubercular sulcus. So a sulcus is the same thing as groove, so you can use either word. Um, moving on to the lateral and medial epicondyles. So the word condyle, if you remember from the past um, lecture or if you remember from just what these bony words mean. A condyle is a rounded, smooth portion of a bone that articulates with another bone. So a condyle here is gonna be this area, this smooth area of the bone, of the humerus, are acting as a condyle. However, they are not, they're, they're sort of have weird shapes to them and they have particular names, they have specific names. So we don't see the word condyle here in the humerus, but we do see the word epicondyle. Um, so the word epicondyle means above the condyle. And so the medial epicondyle is this area of the bone where it sticks out a lot. And the lateral epicondyle is the same thing. So actually, let's look at this. The medial epicondyle is this projection of the bone. It's the widest part of the distal end of this humerus, right? and the lateral epicondyle is on the other side. Now, if you had your arm in anatomical position and you grabbed the widest part of your elbow um, on the, either side, you're, you have your fingers on the epicondyles of the humerus. All right, so I'm going to try and, oops. Oops, sorry about that. Oh no. I am really messing up here. So all I want to do is erase the marks, but I'm having trouble pulling down. There we go. I am definitely not very good at doing this online stuff. All right, so let's look at the um, other terms here. The shaft or body of your bone is going to be um, obviously just everything here, that's the shaft of the body. Um, the deltoid tuberosity is found within the shaft and it is going to be a rough area that's slightly raised. Okay, so you can kind of see how the bone is slightly, a little bit larger here. And then in this image on the other side, you can see that it has a little bit of a texture to it. So the deltoid tuberosity is where the deltoid muscle is going to attach. And the word tuberosity, this is the first time we've seen it, I think. Uh, 
deltoid tuberosity means the tuberosity means that it's an attachment for muscles and when a muscle attaches to the bone it will create an enlargement that the bone will be thicker and the bone will be a little bit rough due to all those connective tissue attachments so that's what this is and your deltoid muscle is your shoulder muscle so this is where it attaches to your humerus all right, let's look at the olecranon fossa, the radial fossa, and the coronoid fossa, um, along with the rest of the end of here. So if you look at the anterior view of our humerus, we have two small divots or fossae. On the medial side, it's called the coronoid fossa. On the lateral side, it's called the radial fossa. Now, you need to know that your forearm bones the radius is the lateral bone in your forearm. The radius is always going to be on the thumb side of your forearm. The ulna is always going to be on the pinky side or medial side. So the radial fossa is going to be a place where the radius, when you flex your elbow joint, when you move it up and close your elbow joint, the radius is going to fit right into that radial fossa. It's actually the head of the radius will fit right in there. So that's why it's called the radial fossa. Why the coronoid fossa is called coronoid fossa is because the ulna has a little projection called the coronoid process that fits into the coronoid fossa. Okay, so when you have your elbow bent, like you have your um, chin resting on your hands, if you're, um, you know, bent elbow on the table, those two forearm bones are resting in their fossa of the humerus. On the posterior side, we have the olecranon fossa. So this is a really large hole or not a hole, it's a fossa, a really large depression. And that is where your elbow joint um, is going to form on the posterior side. So there is a feature of the ulna called the olecranon or the olecranon process that fits right into the olecranon fossa. Okay, so the fossa are named after what parts of the forearm bones fit there. Now let's move on to the capitulum and the trochlea. So the quote unquote condyles, right? The smooth part of the humerus have two different names. The capitulum is this rounded part here. Okay, so cap or caput refers to the head. So it's round like a head. And then the trochlea looks like a little bow tie or a little, um, maybe a uh, I was thinking about a, a spool of thread that's been op that's all gone, right? So this is our trochlea. On the posterior side, we only see the trochlea, so we only see the trochlea here. Okay. So um, if you're in class, um, you definitely want to know. Uh, well, I guess either way, you want to recognize all these features of the humerus. Um, it, you do need to know which ones are on the anterior surface and which ones on the posterior surface. So make sure you know the olecranon fossa is on the posterior surface of the humerus and the coronoid and radial fossa are on the anterior side of the humerus. All right, moving on to the radius. Um, so the way that your forearm bones appear um, or, or join together is in this image here. So the radius is called the radius because it has a perfectly round head. If you look at the head of the radius, it's circular. Um, and so if you think of the radius of a, a circle, right, that's why they call it radius. So the radius has a head. It has that neck, which is a nice narrowing, sort of obvious. Um, and then it has another bump called the radial tuberosity. So here's another tuberosity. A tuberosity, again, is for muscle attachment, right? So the muscle that attaches here is um, one that many people know already. It's called the biceps brachii. It's the most uh, superficial uh, muscle in your arm. And it's what, if you say, show me your muscles, right? You, you flex your biceps. Um, and that's, that's the bump that the tendons of the biceps brachii attaches to. So when you act like you're, you're picking up something or like you're, you're doing a curl with a dumbbell, this is the a point that pulls both of your, like your entire forearm up, that muscle only attaches to the radial tuberosity. So that's why it's, it's a rather large um, tuberosity because it's under a lot of stress. Every time you, you move that large muscle, 
it's going to um, pull on that radial tuberosity. All right, moving on to the styloid process. So on the opposite end of the bone, um, the styloid process is the point at which it creates. So this is um, going to be on the lateral side of the bone. And uh, you can cross out the carpal articular surface. Um, now, the ulnar notch is something that is not quite visible here, but you can see why it's called the ulnar notch. So there's going to be a small little depression or notch that will be the site of articulation for the ulna. So let's take a look at the ulnar notch. Um, let's see ulna. Ah, here's my radius. Oh, I don't have a picture of the ulnar notch very well, but it's going to be on this side. Oh, well. Um, so the ulnar notch, look for it in, um, or you can see, uh, yeah, you're going to have to look for it in other images, um, in the notes and also in your lab manual. Um, the facet for capitulum, you can also cross out. We're not going to cover that. All right, moving on to the ulna. So the ulna has two very distinct ends of the bone. Um, the first word, the head, is actually the distal end of the bone. So it's not the proximal end. The head is the distal end of the bone. And the neck is the narrowed part after the head. The styloid process is the point that's um, also in the head region. So the styloid process, remember that word styloid means like a pen, right? That pointy. We also had a styloid process in the skull. Remember it was a feature of the temporal bone that came down, it looked sharp, and it was for uh, muscle attachments. All right, moving on to the other column. We are not going to cover facet for carpal articulation, so you can cross that out. And then we have a trochlear, a semilunar notch. So this is coming back up to the proximal end of the bone. So we're looking at the bone that forms the elbow joint. The olecranon process is gonna be this entire process that sticks out like this. And if you remember from the humerus, right, we have an olecranon fossa. So this is the part of the ulna that fits into the olecranon fossa, the olecranon process. Then we have a coronoid process, right? So this is this other projection. And remember when you bent your elbow all the way that the coronoid process is going to fit into the coronoid fossa of our humerus. And then we're gonna have a radial notch. So there's gonna be a smooth feature on the side of the ulna. It's going to be on the lateral side of the ulna because it's going to articulate with the radius, which is on the lateral side. So this is the way that your elbow joint is put together. So to give you some visual cues as to what I was talking about, right? So from the back, from the back of your elbow, your olecranon process, right? Here it is. It's going to fit nicely into the olecranon fossa. So if your arm is straight, right, that's very snugly fitting into the olecranon fossa. Then when you bend your elbow, so if your arm is straight, we we'll also have this um, scenario here, right? So you have the head of the humerus um, down and the head of the humerus will articulate with the capitulum. These, you do need to know this, okay? So you need to know how your bones are fitting together. You need to know what bones create the joint and how. So you need to know that the head of the radius articulates with the capitulum. And when you bend your elbow, the head of the radius will glide over the capitulum and then rest into that radial fossa. Same thing on the ulnar side. The, um, oh, you know what? I didn't mention the trochlear notch. The trochlea, this is a feature of the humerus. Let me back up here. I don't know how I missed this. The trochlear notch is this really huge notch, right? It looks like a wrench. And this is also um, called the semilunar notch. But I like trochlear notch because back to here, the trochlea of the humerus fits into the trochlear notch of the ulna. So when you bend your elbow, the coronoid process of the ulna is going to glide over the trochlea and then fit into the coronoid fossa. Okay, so hopefully you can visualize what's happening in your body with the elbow joint. Now, I want to mention that the hinging action of your elbow joint is mainly the humerus 
and the ulna, okay? Because what's linking together and forming that hinge joint is the trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus. So these are the two bones that are going to form that hinging action. What is the radius doing there? So the radius doesn't have a role in the hinging action. However, when you are in anatomical position with your thumbs lateral, and then you are to, um, the action is called um, pronate. So you're going to take your palm and then move it so the palm is now facing behind you, okay? So you're basically just rotating your, your forearm. What's happening there is that you are going to crisscross your radius over the ulna. So in a crossed position, so let me just draw really quickly for you. So your, um, let's see, this, this is your radius, and here's your ulna, right, in a anatomical position. When you pronate your forearm, the radius is going to spin over your ulna. So it's going to um, basically pivot. Um, and this crisscross is what happens with the bones. So the reason why you can spin or pivot the radius over the ulna is because the radius's head is nice and round, right? This head is nice and round, and it's going to spin in that radial notch of the ulna. Okay, moving on to the carpals in the hand. Okay, so just another look and quick review of the radius. The head is round, the neck is narrow, the radial tuberosity is where your biceps brachii attaches. Then we have basically the shaft of the bone. Then at the distal end, we're gonna have the styloid process. Okay, and I think that's all we have. Oh, the ulnar notch. So the ulnar notch of the radius is going to be right on this side where the ulna will articulate. Your wrist, if you can picture these two forearm bones at the distal end, we can see that this little point, that's the styloid process of your radius. This tiny little point is the styloid process of your ulna, right? So when you you can feel these two regions at the base of your hand. Um, and so your wrist is actually formed from those two forearm bones, right? If you wear a bracelet or a watch, you're wearing it over your radius and your ulna. All right, let's look at the hand. So there are short bones that form the wrist portion of your hand, and those are called the carpals. Then there's the first set of long bones, which are called metacarpals. And then the fingers are called phalanges as a group, okay? The way that your hand, your fingers or digits are numbered is that number one is the thumb, and two, three, four, five. So digit five is your pinky, digit one is your thumb. And remember, this is always an anatomical position. Now, every carpal has a name, uh, so let's learn the names of the carpals. Your carpals are, let me just enlarge this picture for you. Oops. Your carpals, um, there are two rows of four. So the way I have them in the notes is the proximal row and the way that they're in your outline, or sorry, your lab manuals, proximal row, distal row. So the proximal row is going to be the scaphoid. The scaphoid is going to be the largest one and it's a nice one to sort of locate your your grounding where is my scaphoid so find the scaphoid the scaphoid is going to be articulating with the radius scaphoid lunate triquetrum so this is hard to pronounce sometimes but que is like the the que sound in question right triquetrum and then pisiform the pisiform is actually resting on top of that triquetrum and it's shaped just like a little p right so pisiform and P. Then the next distal um, row of four is trapezium. So the trapezium forms a joint with your thumb. Trapezoid under digit two. 
your capitate and hamate. Okay, so the way that I like to, and I have remembered these carpal bones, is by a mnemonic. And the mnemonic is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. And the key to learning this is that you always have to start from digit one to digit five. So you're going to move in this direction. You have to find scaphoid. And when you do, you go some lovers try positions, right? Some lovers, the lunate, try, triquetrum, positions is pisiform. Then you go back to the distal row that they can't handle, right? That trapezium they capitate hamate. So as long as you start with the proximal row first, go from thumb to pinky, go back to the distal row, go thumb to pinky, this mnemonic will work. All right. Um, the carpals um, are part of the anatomy of the carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel is going to be, so the way that the carpals are arranged in your hand or the base of your hand here is in a, a concave arrangement so that forms kind of a shallow space. And there's going to be a ligament that runs over that space. And so we're forming a tunnel, right? There's a tunnel that tendons and ligaments and nerves run through, actually one nerve runs through to innervate the hand. And so when you have repetitive motion of your fingers, those tendons that move into the hand are moving inside this very small carpal tunnel. When you have a lot of repetitive motion, sometimes friction can build up and you have swelling. And then that swelling pushes down on the nerve that runs through the carpal tunnel. The nerve is called the median nerve. Um, go ahead and memorize that now because we're going to talk about this again um, in both the nervous system and also in the muscles unit. So um, that's the carpal tunnel. So carpal tunnel syndrome is when you have this swelling occurring from multiple, from, you know, moving your fingers a lot, like typing or knitting or doing small little motions with your fingers moving all the time. Um, and that swelling takes place. Okay, now moving on to the metacarpals and phalanges. The, oops, sorry about that. The metacarpals, every single digit has a metacarpal. So it's the very first long bone in every single digit. So it's named metacarpal one in your thumb, metacarpal two. I'm trying to change color, but I can't. Okay, metacarpal three metacarpal four and metacarpal five. So these are numbered using Roman numerals. So please be familiar with your Roman numerals. And every metacarpal has a head, which is the distal part. Okay, so this is the head of metacarpal two. Everyone has a shaft, which is the middle part. And everyone has a base. So the base is gonna be the proximal end. So this is the base of metacarpal one. Oops. All right, the phalanges are also um, have a head, shaft, and base. But there's three phalanges in your four fingers, and there's only two phalanges in digit one. So let's look at digit one. Digit one only has two phalanges. This is your proximal phalanx, and this is your distal phalanx. However, in the rest of your fingers, you're going to have digits two through five, you're going to have three phalanges. You have a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx, okay? So please make sure you know it's middle phalanx and not medial. A lot of students like to call it the medial phalanx, but remember the word medial means closer to the midline. In this scenario, we don't mean medial. We mean it's in the middle. All right, so the way that we name or that you're tested on these long bones of your hand might be something like this. I might say, what is this region right here, right? And so you would say that this is the proximal phalanx number two, and it's the base, okay? So this is the base of proximal phalanx 
two. If I asked you maybe to name this little tip right here, right, that would be the head of the distal phalanx number one. All right, let's go with something like here. What is this region right here? Okay, that is the shaft of my middle phalanx number four. Okay, so there's a lot to remember there. You have to give me the digit, the actual finger, right? Is it one, two, three, four, or five? You have to give me the bone. Is it a proximal phalanx? Is it a middle phalanx? Or is it a distal phalanx? And then you should also be able to tell me, is it the head, is it the shaft, or is it the base? So lots of things to think about. Now, I want to point out one thing in this picture about the, the carpals, coming back to the carpals. On the anterior surface of the hand, the hamate has a hook feature. So look at this bone here, number eight. That's our hamate. And here, there is a hook. It comes out and protrudes, and it actually forms a hook. If you look at the hamate from the posterior side, it's not present. So you, you know if you're looking at the anterior surface of the hand or the posterior surface of the hand by that hamate. There's other features too. The, the, the metacarpals and the phalanges have different appearances. It's more concave on the anter anterior side and more convex on the posterior side. But this is the dead giveaway, that hamate. All right, I think we are done with the upper extremity. I'll pause the lecture here.